Welcome to the Jewish History Podcast. I am Rabbi Yaakov Walby. Before we begin, just a few short disclaimers. Today's subject is both moderately controversial and also maybe a little bit more technical than most topics, but I found it very interesting and very provocative, and I hope you will too. So that's disclaimer number one. Also, while today's topic addresses issues that come from the ancient times, it's actually an ongoing topic, and I want to make it clear ahead of time that I have some ideas, some opinions on the matter, and there's going to be some speculation on my on my part on matters that are not universally accepted. So I want to make sure everyone knows that before we start. The truth is that this is the second time that I'm recording this podcast on this subject, not because the first time that we recorded it was deleted, but because in my immersion in the subject, I grew endlessly fascinated with it. And even though I recorded with a live audience at the Torch Center, like I always do, afterwards, I felt compelled to do more research. And also, a week ago, I was in New York visiting my parents, and I had a sit-down conversation with one of the world's experts on the subject, and I discovered a wealth of new information. And I figured that I'm going to sit down and re-record it and incorporate some of the new insights that I discovered into the recording for the listening pleasure of the audience. So I am again in the Torch Center, and I'm again recording it, but this time it's just you and me. There's no live audience here. And as always, please consider supporting the efforts of Torch by visiting torchweb.org and maybe making a donation. It really helps me and my colleagues keep our ship afloat. And of course, as always, don't hesitate to reach out, rabbiwalbyajima.com or ywalby at torchweb.org. The word tcheles is mentioned dozens of times in the Torah and is a subject that appears many places in the Talmud and the associated literature. The word tcheles is both a color, like a bluish green or turquoise, and it's also a material, namely wool dyed with this color. However, to fulfill the Torah's requirement for this particular color, the dye has to be derived from the blood of a mysterious aquatic creature called a chilazon. So in order to have tcheles, you have to have this sea-inhabiting creature called the chilazon. And the identity of the chilazon and the process of extracting and priming the dye for tcheles has been gone and disappeared from the Jewish people for about 1,500 years. And in the past 150 years, the subject of Tcheles had a resurgence and kind of resurfaced to the collective consciousness of the Jewish nation because there were several claims of the rediscovery of this Chilazon, of this animal, and the rediscovery of the process of converting it into Tcheles. And therefore, like we said, it's not just an ancient subject, it's actually very much relevant today. So what is Tcheles? Why is it relevant, and what do we know about its alleged rediscovery? The term tcheles first appears in chapter 25 of Exodus with respect to the fundraising efforts for the tabernacle. After the Sinai experience and the sin of the golden calf, God instructs Moses to fundraise the materials needed for building the tabernacle, the mishkan, and creating the vestments, the garments of the high priest. And it begins with a list of 15 or so materials that are needed to construct this tabernacle. One of those materials, so it begins with gold, silver, and copper. And then tcheles, turquoise wool, argamon, which is purple wool, tolashani, starla wool. It goes, it gives a whole list of all kinds of materials that are needed. And of course, we're going to focus primarily on the tcheles. So what is this tcheles used for? So chapter 26, a chapter later, we read about the parochas. That's a partition that's going to separate various parts of the tabernacle, like the holy, from the holy of holies. Various panels that adorn the tabernacle are also made of this material. 
the embroidered screen at the entrance of the tabernacle was made of trellis amongst other materials. In addition, the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, had four special garments that only he wore, and all four of them contained this important material, this techeles wool. In chapter 28 of Exodus, we read about the ephod. It's like an apron-like vestment of the high priest made of techeles, amongst other things. The choshen, the breastplate that contained the 12 stones in which the 12 names of the tribes of Israel were hewn, that too was made partially of treles. There's the me'il, which is a robe made entirely out of treles. On the bottom of the robe, it had those little bells. And finally, the tzitz, which is like a gold head plate on the forehead of the high priest, had treles straps that kept it in place. In short, if we wanted to rebuild the temple and to once again have a high priest, we would very much need to know what Tcheles is and how to get it. But there's actually a second instance where Tcheles is needed, and that is with respect to the tzitzis, which are the fringes that are attached to four-cornered garments. In chapter 15 of the book of Numbers, we read in a paragraph that is, of course, part of the Shema, an instruction to make tzitzis, to make these fringes at the corners of the garments, and on top of the tzitzis, v'nasanu al tzitzis hakanof psil techeles, you have to add a techeles strand onto the tzitzis. Thus, today we still have tzitzis, and you still see people with fringes attached to the corners of the garments. Some people wear it inside of their pants, some tuck it in, but it's still obviously very much in use. And of course, there's the talit, the larger tzitzis that most people wear only while praying. And the Torah tells us that on the tzitzis, there should be also a strand of tchelas. Now, for centuries, no one knew, no one even claimed to know what a chilazon is. What is this animal that you make the tchelas out of? or how to process or access the tcheles, or how to differentiate between real and fraudulent fake tcheles. And thus, for the past millennium and a half, no one, or almost no one, has worn tcheles on their tzitzis. They wore just the white strings, and there's no blue strings, tcheles strings on their tzitzis. Now, this kind of creates of a unique phenomenon. Uh, and I couldn't think of any other example where this uh, would be true. There's a mitzvah in the Torah, a commandment in the Torah, like we said, chapter 15 of the book of Numbers, which tells us to put on the corners of our garments a strand of tcheles, and we don't fulfill it. Not because we can't fulfill it. Like, of course, there's many mitzvahs that are only applicable in a temple or in temple times, and those, of course, we can't fulfill it because we don't have a temple. Here, we have a mitzvah, namely the blue strand on the tzitzis, that we cannot fulfill because of mere ignorance. We don't know the identity of this animal that creates this color, and we don't know how to process it into the requisite tcheles needed to fulfill this mitzvah. And if you read about this mitzvah, you'll notice that this is not just any kind of mitzvah. It's, it's actually very special. Uh, we're told in the Talmud, for example, that the reason why the Almighty tells us to place on our tzitzis, on our fringes, to place a blue tcheles strand. Why blue? Why not green or yellow or orange or some other color? Says the Talmud in the book of Sota, page 17a, because this color, this treles, is similar to the water, which is similar to the heavens, which would remind us of God's heavenly throne, which of course seems to indicate that there's something about this color that is going to evoke a connection between the person who's wearing the tzitzis with the treles and God in the 13th century, 
there was a book written called the Sefer HaChinuch, which means the book of mitzvos or the book of education, the book of priming a person for mitzvos. And in that book, it delineates all 613 mitzvos in the order that they appear in the Torah. And in this mitzvah of tzitzis, it tells us that the symbolism of the blue string and the white strings found in the tzitzis are that the white strings represent the human body and the blue strings represent the human soul. And by taking the blue strings and wrapping them around the white strings, by taking the tcheles and, and, and encircling the white strings of the tzitzis, that is supposed to be emblematic and representative of the fact that we're supposed to take our soul and wrap it around our body and use it kind of to impose the will of the soul, the will of our spiritual halves over our physical halves. So again, we see this idea that this tzitzis really has a lot of meaning and symbolism about not just the mitzvah itself, but really the broader objective of Torah. And like we said, we haven't really had it for a very long time. There's at least a thousand some odd years in Jewish history where this mitzvah is not fulfilled by any Jew. Now, to be clear, if someone only has white strings on their tzitzis, so it's quite clear from all the commentaries that they still fulfill the mitzvah because, well, they don't have the blue. However, the mitzvah of tzitzis, the mitzvah of, of the strands, of the fringes and the corner of the clothing is incomplete without the tcheles. And that reality spawned many efforts, or at least several efforts, to try to rediscover the process of making tcheles to be able to fulfill the mitzvah of tzitzis completely. And I think, I think the first question to ponder is the history of why it disappeared. Why is it lost? Why is there this gap where no one knows or claims to know what the chilazon is, what this creature is, and how to make chilas? So what's important to stress here is that if you understand a little bit, even the basics of Jewish history in the 4th century, 5th century, 6th century, etc., you'll find that there's a steady migration of Jews out of Israel, primarily to Babylon and then eventually uh, all over the world. It's quite clear from the sources that whatever this chilazun, this sea creature that gives us the tales, whatever it is, it originates in the Mediterranean. And thus, if you're in Israel, you have more access to the Mediterranean and hence, ergo, more access to these animals. But as there is an increasing percentage of Jews that are leaving Israel, moving to Babylon and elsewhere, there's less Jews in Israel, and therefore the connection between the Jews and the source of the Tcheles is becoming, is becoming less strong. And the Talmud indicates that already in the 6th and the 7th century, the Tcheles became a rarer and more diminishing Commodity. In fact, the Talmud says that people would try to pass off fake fraudulent tcheles and try to sell it to unsuspecting consumers of tcheles and make them believe that it was real. And if you understand kind of the layout of the Jewish nation, it's quite understandable. You have people in Israel, they're sourcing the tcheles, they're traveling over the world, primarily to Babylon, to where Jews are, and they're selling them tcheles. And they are obviously incentivized to give off something which is cheaper to access, cheaper to find, and still get paid top dollar for it. But again, that anecdote alone, that the Talmud talks about all kinds of tests that were done to weed out the frauds, that of course shows that even at that time, even when Tales was accessible, it was still quite rare and therefore quite expensive. But in addition, we know historically that the whole region, the whole Middle East was awash in turmoil. There was conquest. The Jews were exposed to various degrees of persecution. 
And even when times were good, it was hard to get. Certainly when times are bad, there's a very intricate process of, of processing it, of, of, of honing it. It had to be transported. In addition, there was decrees by the Romans against the trade of certain dyes because these dyes were reserved for royalty. And in fact, the the Ramban, Nachmanis, the commentary, 13th century, he writes that the reason why Tchelis is not ubiquitous is because it was reserved only for the Gentile kings. Thus, we have a process where already it's very hard to get, and as time progresses, it's becoming increasingly rarer, until it just disappears. The Talmud records uh, a fascinating dialogue between two giants of Torah in Babylon. The Talmud says that Abaye asked a question to Rav Shmuel bar Rav Yehuda. The question was, Tchelas, how do you dye it? So he responds, Rav Shmuel bar Yehuda responds, we bring the blood of a sea creature called the Chilazon, and we mix it with certain herbs, and we put them into a pot, and we boil the whole concoction together, and then we take a little bit of the dye in an eggshell, and we test it with a wad of wool to see whether the dye took hold properly in the wool. And then we spill out the dye that's left over in the eggshell, and then we burn the wad of wool that was dyed for the process of testing. Now, this is really interesting because this is a documentation of a conversation that happened in the 5th century. And the Talmud says, at the time we know that Tchelos was still extant. And yet, Abaye is asking a question, well, how do, you, how do you process it? Which means that even at the time where it was extant, where people did have access to Tchelos, it wasn't known to all the process of deriving it, of, 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 of making it. And it's interesting because Abaye is one of the most prolific teachers and scholars in Jewish history. And even he did not know how to do it. Now, who was his partner? Who did he address the question to? He addressed the question to Rav Shmuel bar Rav Yehuda. And we know from other sources that he was someone who was in Babylon but traveled to Israel and spent significant time in Israel and then he returned to Babylon. And there's many examples in the Talmud where the rabbis in Babylon would ask him all kinds of questions once he got back to Babylon. They would debrief him to try to, to investigate, to ask, get questions that can, uh, based upon his discoveries in Israel once he got back to Babylon. So Abaye is the great rabbi in Babylon, and he's asking questions of Shmuel Bar of Yehuda about the Tchelos, which was only sourced from Israel. And that again shows us that even when the Tchelos was indeed in use, it was not so available, or certainly it wasn't so well known of how to do it, and it had to be imported to Babylon. By the 8th century, the Midrash declares that the Tchelos was extinct, and at that point, thenceforth, the Tzitzis was only done with white strings. And the Midrash tells us, Now we only have white strings because the Tcheles, well, that was put away. And those words in the Midrash are actually very consequential to the whole effort to rediscover Tcheles. Because some interpret this Midrash as saying that the Tcheles was put away. What do you mean was put away? It was like put away by God. It's almost as if God hid it from us. Not that we lost it, but God put it away, and therefore we're not going to get it back until God gives it back. Regardless, the fact that this conversation between Abai and Rav Shmuel Barav Yehuda is enshrined in the Talmud for posterity, it obviously makes it clear that the authors of the Talmud wanted us to know, to be aware of this conversation. In my sense, the reason why we have such a conversation and others that are similar is because there was a concern that the identity of the Chilazon may get lost. It was already becoming scarcer at the time, and therefore the Talmud wanted to 
incorporate it into the – the authors of the Talmud want to incorporate it into the text of the Talmud forever, for eternity, so that we will have clues that we could use to try to rediscover the Chilazon and the Tchelas. And there's, in fact, a similar teaching in the Talmud. This is from Menachos on page 44a, which gives us much more information, a whole list of clues about the identity of this Chilazon. Tan Rabbanon, the rabbis taught, Chilazon, this Chilazon, its body is similar to that of the sea, its anatomy is similar to that of a fish, it emerges from the water onto the land every 70 years, and you die, Tcheles, with its blood. Therefore, concludes the Talmud, because the Chilazon is so rare, Tcheles is so expensive. And this description of the Talmud is going to be used by all those who want to try to rediscover the Tcheles. It's going to be used together with other clues found in Talmudic literature to try to assemble from it what we know about the Chilazon and using those criteria to see if we can try to find the Chilazon today. So what do we know? So the Talmud says that it's a fish. Now, it doesn't say that it's actually a fish. It says that its, its anatomy is similar to a fish. A fish, of course, is a fish. And this is kind of like a fish, but maybe not completely a fish. Rashi, in his commentary to Sanhedrin 91, says that it's a worm. The Midrash says that so long as it grows, its shell grows with it. Rashi in the Talmud of Medilla on page 6a, says that it climbs mountains. Obviously, most fish, the way we think of a fish, does, don't climb mountains, don't ever leave the water. In the book of Shabbos, the Talmud tells us that the way they would access the blood of this chilazon is with, uh, they would crack open something, which again, sounds a lot like it has a shell. So while it's an aquatic creature, it could also survive on mountains, i.e. outside of water. So this, these lists of, of descriptions seem to indicate that this chilazon is actually a snail. It's aquatic, it could live in water, but it could also survive outside of water. And in order to access whatever it has within it, you have to crack it. In addition, the Talmud tells us that the location of this chilazon is between Tzur and Haifa, which is in northern Israel. Uh, another interesting clue we find, this again from the Talmud in Shabbos, it tells us a kind of an interesting little quirk, that when they had Chilazon trappers, they had people whose job it was to try to get to catch this animal, they wanted to keep the animal alive as long as possible. Why? Because once it dies, once it's dead, its die is adversely affected. And the Rambam adds another criteria that its blood is black. And he tells us, in addition, the process. You take the blood of this animal, you put it in a cauldron, you add other ingredients the way dye makers do, and then you dip in the wool. And finally, a very important qualifier and that is that the color of the wool dyed with the chilazon made the real tcheles, the color does not fade, it doesn't change, it doesn't diminish. You can wash it a hundred times and the color will remain fast. Whereas other colors, other dyes that are not the true tcheles, the color will wear off eventually. Now, it, I just read a whole list of descriptions about the identity, the makeup of this Chilaz zone, to me, it seems patently obvious that the reason why we find so many sources describing the identity of this animal is because there was a suspicion that its identity may be lost. And therefore, the sages of the Talmud, they gave us the tools that we would need to recover it. And if we make a list of all these clues and we find a candidate that seems to fit all the criteria, then maybe we got our guy.
Now, the first effort to try to find the Tcheles was done by Rabbi Gershon Hanoch Henech Leiner. He was the chief rabbi of Radzin, 1839 to 1890. He was a monumental Torah scholar who authored many Torah books, but also was phenomenally knowledgeable in other areas of scholarship and science, and he undertook a major effort to rediscover the Chilazon and Tcheles. Eventually, he would write three books on the subject. The first book was called Mamar Sefunit Munichol, based upon a verse in Deuteronomy 33, and he argued in his book, in the first one, that we have to try to find and rediscover the Chilazon even in modern times, and we have to use all the clues available to us in the sources. And in this first book, he drew up a list of 11 requirements, and any animal that fulfills all 11 requirements is probably your chilazon. You find that, and you find the animal, and you make its blood into dye, and you have your tchelas. That was the argument of the first book. Now, this was somewhat controversial at its time. And the most famous opponent to this idea, to the idea that you work from the requirements or from the characterizations of the Talmud and kind of reverse engineer them to try to find the animal, the famous opponent to that was the Beis Halevi, was Rabbi Salavechik. And he is purported to have said that, well, the identity of the chilazon is a matter of fact. There is one animal in the world called the chilazon that produces the chilas. And that can only be verified if supported by tradition. By trying to shoehorn a given species into the criteria that you find in the Talmud, that's not a way to determine the identity of the chilazon. Uh, some actually characterize his opposition somewhat differently. They say that what the base Halevi, what Rabbi Salavechik said, is that not having a tradition of what the Chilazon is, is akin to having a tradition that it is not X, Y, or Z, what you seem to find. Because after all, maybe there's a hundred or a thousand species that fulfill all 11 criteria but are not actually the Chilazon. Regardless, after he compiled, after this rabbi of Radzin, Rabbi Leiner, compiled the first book with the criteria of the Chilazon, he embarked on a quest to find an animal that fulfills those requirements. And he traveled to Naples, Italy, which at the time was home to the largest aquarium in the world. And he spent the better part of a year, studying the different Mediterranean sea creatures in their natural habitat. And after his rigorous investigation, he concluded that the Chilazon is the sepia officinalis, which is the species name, a type of squid known as the common cuttlefish. This is one of the unique fishes that's capable, not fishes, this is a unique fish that is capable of living on land for brief periods of time. He returned back to Poland with copious amounts of the blood of the common cuttlefish and succeeded in developing a procedure that produced bluish dye from its blood. And he published his findings in a second book on the topic called Psil Tchelas. So that's it. We got it, right? Well, not so fast. His conclusions were accepted by his followers, and until today, those that come from the Hasidic dynasty, the Radziner dynasty that he headed, still wear his version of the Tchelas. But quite few of the Halakhic authorities have accepted his stance on the issue. For example, the greatest Halakhic authority of the time, Rav Yitzhak Chon Specter, he said, well, the Midrash says that the Almighty put away the Tcheles in Geniza. It's archived only when the Almighty wants to give us back this mitzvah will we be able to fulfill it. And that was one of many 
questions that he got on his position, and in response to those questions, he wrote yet a third book called The Ein Hatchelas. So that's basically the way it was for the next 20 years. There was this claim of the rediscovery that was not very widely accepted. In the 1910s, a young rabbi living in England wrote his doctoral thesis on the subject of Tchelas. And today you can buy it in a book titled The Royal Purple and the Biblical Blue. This young rabbi, his name was Yitzchak Isaac Halevi Herzog, he would soon become the first chief rabbi of Ireland and eventually the first chief rabbi of Israel in 1948. He has some very famous descendants. For example, his son Chaim Herzog, he was a general in the IDF, became the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, became the president of Israel. His grandson, also named Isaac Herzog, is currently a member of the Knesset, the head of the opposition, and was just selected to be the head of the Jewish agency. In his thesis, he disagrees with some of the Ratziner rabbi's conclusions. For one, he argues that not every time it says the word chilazon, it's referring to the same chilazon that made tchelas. It's possible the word chilazon is a reference for a certain class of animals. Only one of them is the one that makes tchelas. But his most damning claim was the investigation that he did into the dye-making process uh, in the Redziner method. And he concluded that the blue that came out of the dye of the blood of the cuttlefish was not a result of some sort of cuttlefish secretions. Rather, it came from the chemical, chemical additives that were mixed with any organic material. And he proved this point by taking other fish and adding all the other ingredients that were used, and all of them resulted in the same synthetic blue. He thus concluded that the method that was prevalent for the previous 25 years was flawed. And, okay, well, if it's, so if it's not the cuttlefish, then what is it? In his book, The Royal Purple and the Biblical Blue, he promotes a marine snail, known then as the Murex trunculus, as the ideal candidate for the chilazon, and he advanced many reasons to support that conclusion, but there were several problems. Well, most notably, is that when you would track the snail's shell in the specific spot to access the mucus gland to make the dye, well, the dye would turn many colors. It would begin as yellow, and it would pivot to green, and then it would turn blue, but then it would turn purple, and it would stay purple. And he could not figure out a way to get it to freeze in the blue stage. And number two, the color of the chilazon, of that snail, was brownish. The Talmud makes it clear that the color of the snail is blue. So he tried to suggest other animals maybe, but regardless, that was the kind of the state of the chilas for many decades. Some people followed the opinion of the common cuttlefish of the Red Zener, and the Murex trunculus produced a purple and not a blue dye, which obviously disqualified it. In 1983, there was a fortuitous and dramatic and transformational discovery that forever altered the discussion. There was a chemist, his name was Otto Elsner, and he was playing around with the dye brought out of that same snail, that same Murex trunculus, and he actually exposed the dye to sunlight. And when he did that, a photochemical reaction took place that froze it in the blue stage and prevented it from turning the wool into purple. There's a legend that he was cooking the dye inside and his wife didn't like the smell. And she said, oh, take it outside, take it outside. He brought it outside. And then the wool that it produced remained blue and never turned purple. So the same snail that was advanced by Rabbi Herzog 70 years earlier, now we found a way to turn the wool dyed in its blood blue. And today, when most people discuss about the rediscovery of Tcheles, 
they almost invariably ref are referring to this one, this murex truntulus or hexaplex truntulus or the purpura. And I'll be honest with you, when I began researching the subject, I was kind of skeptical that this is the right one. But I can tell you today that I'm sort of convinced that indeed this is the right one. So what's some of the evidence? So first of all, any wool that is dyed with the potion from this snail's blood remains blue no matter how many times it's washed. Like you remember, the Talmud says that one of the hallmarks of Tcheles is that it's color fast. It doesn't fade, it doesn't weather, it doesn't diminish the color no matter how much you use it. The Tcheles expert that I spoke to in, in, in New York, he said, well, if you carry the Redziner Tcheles, the earlier version, the cuttlefish version of the Tcheles, you carry it from the store home, you look at your hand and your hands are all blue. I have a friend here in Houston who told me that his Tcheles on his tzitzis, he's had them now for 11 years and the color has not faded one bit. So that's the first piece of evidence. But in addition, the murex contains an enzyme that's needed for the production of the dye. And this enzyme begins to decompose soon after death, which sounds a lot like the Talmud. The Talmud says that the chilazon trappers wanted to keep the animal alive because otherwise the dye would suffer. So again, same kind, uh, it seems like that criteria is also met. In addition, the Talmud indicates that the true treles is indistinguishable from a blue dye of vegetable origin called the klailon, which is indigo. The dye that is ultimately derived from the murex trunculus, from that snail, when it's blue, is molecularly identical to the indigo. So one thing is universally accepted. Whether or not we found the right snail, regardless, what well, we know for sure that the color of the blue that is derived from that snail is identical to Tchelas because it's identical to the Kha'ilon, which the Talmud says is identical to Tchelas. The only question is, is there perhaps another aquatic animal that also gives us the same color, which is the correct Chilazon, and this one is not? That's the only argument. But everyone agrees that the color, the blue color that we get from the Murex trunculus is indeed the correct color. Whether it's the correct animal is a subject of debate. But to me, one of the strongest pieces of evidence that I heard is the fact that the Talmud acknowledges that there were people that were trying to pass off frauds, namely the indigo, the Klaelan one, and it gave us all kinds of ways to ensure that we have real trellis, not fake trellis. Now, if this murex snail is not the chilazon, then there's not one, but there's two potential fraudulent trela sources. Number one, the Klaelan, the indigo. Number two, the murex. That, to me, seems to be very strong evidence that indeed the murex is the correct snail. In addition, many of the greatest sages of Jewish history assigned a species name to the Chilazon, the Purfura or Purpura. Uh, Rav Hirsch, for example, the Shilti Gaborim, the Chavas Yair, the Yaivetz, some of the great Torah scholars of over the centuries, people who were reliable, and we could be assured that they did their homework before naming the species, they gave it that name. And that name, the Purpura, is still attributed to this snail, to this murex trunculus, in a whole bunch of places in the world. It seems very strong evidence that this is indeed the same one that was being discussed over the centuries. The Tehelas expert that I spoke to said a very deep point. He said, let's assume hypothetically that there was a snail called the Purpura, but it did not yield Tehelas. It didn't produce blue dye. We would not go around saying, well, all those Torah giants who said that the 
that the chilazon is a purpura, they made a mistake, of course we wouldn't do that. We would attribute it to a name change. There was a snail, there was an animal called the purpura, and indeed that was the chilazon. But over the course of history, the name was swapped, and there's a different animal that's now called the purpura. That's what would have happened had the purpura today not yielded chilas. But now that the purpura is the only snail that we know of that does, in fact, yield chelas. How could you possibly say, it's preposterous to argue, that this is not the same chilazon that's been referenced by our sages? It's, I think, very outlandish to argue that there was a purfura that produced chelas, and the current animal that everyone calls purfura, which also produces chelas, is not the right one that was addressed or that was talked about over history. It seems to me to be quite incontrovertible that the Purfura of today is the Purfura of yesteryear and is also the Chilazon of antiquity. There's also a copious archaeological evidence for this claim. For example, we see there was a discovery of a violet swatch of wool dated back to the first century, which we know was colored by Murat's dye. They also found a second fragment of blue-dyed fabric, which was also colored by the, the Murat's trunculus. That was its source. Uh, in addition, archaeologists in Israel discovered mounds of Murat's trunculus shells broken in the exact spot of the snail where it's necessary to obtain, to, to obtain the dye in the same locations that the Talmud says that the chilazon was prevalent. There are some people that are kind of hesitant to use archaeology as proof, but there is some precedent to using nature and archaeology to recover unknown information. Uh, for example, there's a discussion in the commentaries about what parchments from the Torah to put into which compartments of the tefillin. The tefillin, the phylacteries which go on the head and on the arm, if you look closely, you'll notice that the one that goes on the head is comprised of four separate compartments. In each one of those compartments, there is a scroll from the Torah. Now, the commentaries agree what are those four scrolls, but they disagree as to what is the correct location, or which scroll to put into which compartment. And the sources bring a discovery, an archaeological discovery, where they found in the tomb, and near the tomb of Ezekiel, there was buried a pair of tefillin. And they opened it up to find out, was it like this or was it like that? Now, some argued, well, if it was buried, that seems to be proof that it was an incorrect one. But regardless, this idea was posited or was presented in a halakhic context that we can perhaps use archaeology for halakha to find out was it like this or was it like that. There's also a story in the Talmud the book of Shabbos about a, a, the, the discussion is that sits that gold headpiece that went on the forehead of the high priest how were the words on it? How were they written? Was it written on one line or on two lines? And one of the rabbis says, well, I went to Rome and I saw the Romans had stolen the various vessels of the, of the temple and I saw the actual tzitz and I found, was it one line, was it two lines? And that, again, seems to indicate that using physical evidence that we find uh, from the past is perhaps admissible to determine just the reality of what the mitzvah looked like, what did the tzitz look like, how to align the, the tefillin, and maybe we could use that, uh, that same principle to figure out the identity of the animal. There are still some unanswered questions. Does it look like the sea? It seems to look like the seabed. And if you actually pull out one of these snails, it has like a bluish, greenish coating that very resembles the sea. Uh, the 70-year cycle is, is somewhat of a mystery because the Talmud says that it comes out every 70 years. And Rabbi Herzog himself already worked around that problem by saying, well, that's hyperbole. It means it's exceedingly rare. 
In fact, the Talmud does use the same timestamp of 70 years with respect to the correct rate of execution in a Jewish court of law. How often should a Jewish court of law execute uh, someone who is guilty of capital punishment? So the Talmud says once every 70 years. Again, that doesn't mean that if 70 years are up, you have to find someone to kill. Of course not. It just It's a term of saying this is something that's, that's vanishingly uncommon. And the Talmud also indicates that there were dedicated chilazon trappers. Obviously, you don't hire someone to stick around to see will a once-in-70-year phenomenon appear. You don't hire someone to await Haley's Comet. Uh, seemingly, what it means is that it's rare for it to come onto the water, but they would have chilas and trappers that would go look for it in the sea. Now, there's an additional point here that the Rambam writes that the blood that is the source of the trellis is black. As an aside, there is a tradition to put black stripes on a talit, on a, on a tzitzis. Some argue that that is, in fact, as a remembrance of the Tcheles because of the Rama's position that the blood of the Tcheles is black. Others give uh, different reasons why we have that custom. Where does the Rambam get this idea that the blood of the Chilazon is black? There is no Talmudic source uh, along those lines. So some have theorized that maybe the Rambam himself found an animal that he thought was the Chilazon and it had black blood. The Tcheles expert that I spoke to last week, he posited something entirely different. He says, well, Aristotle wrote about the Chilazon, wrote about a certain snail that is used to produce uh, a dye for wool. And Raman was just quoting Aristotle because Aristotle writes that its blood is, is, is like as black as tar and he describes how it would live in the winter, in the summer. How many bumps does it have on its shell? Where does it come from? He says the same place where the Talmud says that it's indigenous to. So it's important to stress that this murex, trunculus, which most or many people believe is in fact the chilazon, is still compatible with the rum, even though its blood is not actually black. When it would be dried, they would take out the blood and they would dry it, it turns dark, turns blackish. And there's also a black vein near the dye pouch, near the mucus pouch that is used to make the treles, to make the potion for the treles. There's a little black stripe. So maybe that's what he was referring to. I know this is somewhat of a technical description, I would advise everyone to go online and check it out to see how they make the treles and how they take the snail and take the little bit of the mucus and they eventually are able to get the blue dye. Again, today this is a subject of great debate. Uh, a lot of people wear tzitzis with the blue strain that comes from this murex trunculus. A lot of people are very wary of that. Some have alachic reasons why they don't want to do it. Some have kabbalistic reasons why they won't do it. Some are very hesitant to take the blood of a non-kosher snail and to dip your tzitzis into that. If it's the right one, then great. But what if it's the wrong one? It doesn't seem quite appropriate. And maybe it would even invalidate the tzitzis if you take a non-kosher animal and dip it in. And others are also can maybe convinced of the legitimacy, or at least the legitimacy of the claim that the murex trunculus is indeed the correct snail to make the treles, but are hesitant to incur financial costs on the public. Uh, someone once asked Rabbi Steinman of Blessed Memory, who was the leader of the religious Jews in Israel until his passing a few months ago, someone asked him, well, why don't you wear tzitzis with treles, with the blue string in it? And he says, well, if I do it, everyone, everyone will copy me. And I don't want to make everyone have to pay uh, large financial outlays based upon something which is a doubt. So he said, well, wait a minute. You, you don't need to wear them sticking out. Get the blue strings and then tuck the blue strings into your pants and keep only the white strings out. Why don't you do that? So he responded, well, maybe I do. How would you know? Maybe they're tucked in. And this was this a position that is still somewhat accepted by a lot of people where they they themselves wear the blue strings 
but they tuck them into their pants and only expose the white screen so that way, that way they wouldn't compel uh, others to try to follow them. Again, there's always a suspicion. Maybe there is some other snail. Maybe there is some other fish. Maybe there is another species we're not aware of that is in fact the real Chilazon. And even though this mirrored strunculus, this hexaplat strunculus, this purpura seems like fulfills all the criteria. You can answer all the questions. Maybe it's right, but maybe it's still wrong. And therefore, it's not a, an ironclad, definite, authoritative ruling that we found the correct chilazon, and we know how to make chilas, but it actually seems very much so. Uh, and there are still other questions. Uh, for example, how many strains to die? Do you die one of eight, two of eight, four of eight? How do you tie the strains? What are the other ingredients that you use uh, besides for the blood of the chila zone? Again, remember the Talmud says that you have to – you would test it. It seems like there wasn't an exact science of the potion. Is it appropriate that half the Jews in the world wear tzitzis – uh, that have blue strains and the other half doesn't. It seems like we different religions. Of course, we're not. Now, on the other hand, well, if it's possible for us to fulfill the mitzvah perfectly, uh, the white strains and the blue strains, maybe we should try to do that as well. There are other questions. Is it the blood? A mucus sac sounds like a, like a secretion. Why does the Talmud use the word blood? There's all kinds of scholarship. There's many books written on this subject, but this is an, an overview of it. And of course, our hope is that we're not making mistakes. We don't really have the right one. There's a lot of people that are quite convinced. Uh, they should not be walking around with unnecessarily colored tzitzis. If it's the wrong one, we hope to have the opportunity to fulfill the mitzvah perfectly. Again, please visit torchweb.org and consider supporting the efforts of Torch, myself, and my colleagues really rely on the support and generosity of the public. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to next time. All the best.